Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. We're glad you're with us in person. We welcome our visitors this morning, and we welcome everyone who's watching from home. Our mission is to share God's love and shine God's light, and we hope that you experience the light and love of Christ this morning in worship. I have a couple of announcements. Um, Two weeks from today, on December 8th, at the close of worship, there will be a congregational meeting. Uh, it'll be short. <laughs> the purpose of the meeting is to elect new deacons and elders, and also to approve Pastor Emily's terms of call for 2025. So put that on your calendars and hope that you'll be able to attend on December 8th. Uh, this coming Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock, uh, the deacons are organizing the hanging of the greens to decorate the church for Advent and the Christmas season. So if you're able to come and help out, I know they would appreciate many hands make the work go faster and get done quicker. Uh, if you recall, last week we celebrated the milestone anniversary for the Harmons. I also want to make you aware that our pastor and her husband celebrated their first anniversary this past week. So we congratulate them as well. Are there any other announcements? Prayer concerns or joys? John. Had a, we had a good day yesterday, a busy day. Other? Yes. Um, just for the okay, yes. Prayers for the Grimmer family, whose son experienced a pretty disastrous health issue. Yes, Roxy. Prayers for Sarah, who's just been diagnosed with cancer. Anything else? Yes. Good results. Prayers of joy for Nicole's dad, who's come out on top of some health challenges, so that's always good news. Yes? Okay, well, safe, safe travels for you and for everyone else in the country and <laughs> the area that's going to be traveling. There will be a lot of people moving in this next few days, so uh, yes. Anything else? Okay, then at this time, we're going to have a moment for stewardship. Welcome to Stewardship Sunday. Session thought that with the installation of Pastor Emily, it was time to reflect on one of our most favorite topics, stewardship. We have conveniently been pushing this topic down the road for, let's say, before COVID. To me, stewardship is gratefully giving back to God for all the blessings that I have received. All of us want to belong. At one time in our life, we have belonged to clubs, leagues, organizations. But why do we want to be part of this group? We believe in the values of the group, we like the people that are in the group. The group makes us feel good and comfortable 
being a part of it. We can contribute to the common goal. The group makes us feel very valuable. Wait, have we just described belonging to First Presbyterian Church? <laughs> when we belong to a group or organization, we generally know that there is going to be a small fee for the operation of the group. Our church dues are called per capita. In 2025, our per capita will be $40 per member. This year, our contributions have covered about 58% of our per capita. The $1,210 that we did not receive from our members has been taken out of the income of the church operating operation. Wouldn't it be nice if we wanted to belong and thought a little differently about per capita? As we all know, our church has faced many challenges in the last four years. The trials of COVID and not being able to worship in person. All of us remember way too well worshiping in cars in Lord of the Lakes parking lot or having church held outside of our front steps and sitting in cars and listening. Our greetings were not hugs and handshakes, but waves, and our smiles were hidden behind masks. And then there were unexpected transitions. After COVID, we find out that our pastor and her family have been called to a western part of the state. Two years without a pastor and the wonder and worry if God would answer our prayers or was even listening made us question about the process of calling a pastor. And then there was the answered prayer. God answered our prayers and our faith is being restored. We have been blessed with Reverend Emily and we are feeling a little more comfortable we are a smaller group of people than we were before all of this. And going through these experiences, we are a group who believe in each other and want to belong and carry out the mission of First Presbyterian Church. Where do we stand financially through the month of October? Our income for this or for this year is $77,126. Our expenses for the year are $92,033. So we have a deficit of $14,900 and some dollars. Now, I have to tell you that this deficit does reflect the $7,500 that we were charged when the new street was put in and we had to put in new laterals for to the fellowship hall and to our church basement. Looking forward to the year of 2025, there are a few certainties. Pastor Emily's compensation will be increasing based on the recommendation of Presbytery and the approval of the Wyawega and Winnicani sessions, an increase of 2.5% has been agreed upon. The total compensation will be shared, as Betty said, in a couple of weeks at the congregational meeting. We also know that our per capita, as we talked about before, will be increasing by $2 a member to $40. Fortunately, we are not looking at any major operation expenses. At this point, the roof is in good shape. We've just had this past week had our heating and air conditioning checked and everything is currently working. So our operating budget for 2025 should reflect just the normal operating expenses. 
What are some of the ways that we can give to our church? Well, we have the traditional weekly church envelope. We also have the pew card, which is an electronic giving. And then there's a systematic way of giving. Have we thought about this, a weekly or monthly authorization by you to your bank or financial institution to send a check to the church? No muss, no fuss, no forgetting, it just gets done. And then there's some of us who have reached that golden age where we take our dollars, are required to take our dollars from investments. RMD as it's called, required uh, deductions. This is a good way of giving to the church and also meeting our requirements by tax laws. Belonging to the church means financial support to our church. Belonging not only means willful giving, but our time and talent. We are not too old or too busy to share our time and talent. None of us move as quickly as we did last week, last month, or a year. Does anyone care if it takes a little bit longer to get a job done? At least most of us have a little bit more time. By no donating your time and your talents, you are belonging. What are the, some of the ways that we can donate our time and our talents? One of the ways is by helping us out at Thrift and Gift. This is one of our significant out-of-church revenues uh, that we have. We need a minimum of six people on the fourth Sunday of the month, from t Saturday, from 10 until 2. You can show up on Sunday, it just may not be open. If you can donate a couple of hours, or it can donate four hours, it's a wee easy way to help our church and community. Some of you have the talent of sewing, and we have a mitten tree. Some of you have a talent for baking. You can host a, help host a coffee hour. Most of you are already helping with the chili supper by donating or just being there and helping out and serving. You can join the choir. <laughs> can help with the multimedia. Yes. <laughs> Some of you like to garden. Caring for the planters in front of their church in the spring, help us trim. Goodness sakes, it keeps on growing. We have many seasonal decorations, and one of those is helping out on Tuesday. Karen does a great job for us, but there are things that we can help her with, like washing windows, everybody's joy. But somebody likes to do it. You just have to share your talent. Or, heaven forbid, cleaning the stove in the kitchen. It needs to be done. Grab a cup of coffee and a friend and have fun donating for a short period of time. We belong by sharing our time and our talents. We could also, heaven forbid, serve as a deacon or an elder. Friends, this has become a problem for our church. Serving as a deacon or an elder does not require as much time as we think. I know most of us have served in that capacity, being a small church, and we have to get and keep being recycled. Talk to an elder and a deacon and become informed of the responsibilities involved. You might be surprised that your talents may be of use. 
and then look around and ask. If it's not me, then who? Working with friends and belonging to a group of people help us serve our church and both it is both rewarding and can be done by all of us. Share your talents. At this time of stewardship reflection, let us reevaluate our gifts to the church. First Presbyterian needs you, and we thank you for your time, your talents, and your gifts. We pray that you will share them generously. If you have received or should have received a pledge sheet, these can be turned in with the offering uh, either today or in the next couple of weeks. If you are able, please stand and join me in our call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we pray that someday an arrow will be broken not in something or someone, but by each of humankind to indicate peace, not violence. Someday, oneness with creation rather than domination over creation will be the goal to be respected. Someday, fearlessness to love and make a difference will be experienced by all people. Then the eagle will carry our prayer for peace and love, and the people of the red, white, yellow, brown, and black communities can sit in the same circle together to communicate in love and experience the presence of the great mystery in their midst. Someday can be today for you and me. Amen. We will now sing hymn 336. We gather together.
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sins to God. Please join me in our unison prayer of confession. Righteous God, you have crowned Jesus Christ as Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him and are slow to acknowledge his rule. We give allegiance to the powers of this world and fail to be governed by justice and love. In your mercy, forgive us. Raise us a claim as, as ruler of all, that we may be loyal ambassadors, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. May the God of mercy who forgives you all your sins strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen.
Thank you, choir, for that beautiful number. Please pray with me. Living God, help us to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on the Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. The New Testament reading this morning comes from the 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 12. Just as the body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts from one body, so it is with Christ. For we were baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greatest gift, the greater gifts, the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock 
and Redeemer. Amen. This morning, we are going to do something a little different. Instead of focusing on a gospel lesson or a story from the Old Testament, we are going to venture back in our Bibles to the letters of the New Testament. Our focus today will be on one of Paul's letters to the Corinthians. Indeed, we will focus on his earliest surviving letter to the fledgling congregation. The apostle is writing from Ephesus, where he intends to stay for a while before making his way to Corinth. But it is painfully clear to him that some pastoral wisdom is very much needed right now because the church in Corinth is struggling. In his letter, Paul is up front with the Corinthians. He has received reports from his colleagues in ministry, and he has learned that there are several quarrels among the church's membership. Different factions vying for control of the church, an indifference toward matters of morality a disregard for those who don't fully understand the faith just yet. There's even a marginalization of disadvantaged members, especially during meal times when the poorer members receive meager helpings and the wealthier members receive servings in excess. It's a dire situation in Paul's eyes for they are no longer of one mind or one purpose. Unity has been replaced with disunity, concord with discord. What's perhaps striking about this letter to the Corinthians is its continued relevance to the church today. Although this letter was penned in or around 54 CE, it holds deep and meaningful pastoral wisdom and direction that speaks to churches struggling to find unity and a shared mission in 2024. It can even speak to us here at Winnicani today. Now, my experience of this congregation is undoubtedly very limited in scope. After all, I have only been with you all since mid-June, a total of five months, give or take. But thankfully, I do not feel the need to issue a complete pastoral smackdown as Paul did with the church at Corinth. I have not witnessed any major divisions or factions working against one another for control nor have I witnessed a disregard or indifference toward one another. Indeed, I have had the privilege of watching you pray for one another and offer one another peace and love and support in worship. I have watched you work together in meetings and in your preparation for meals and in opportunities for outreach to the wider community. At the same time, I imagine that it has not always been easy. In the last few years alone, you have all endured a sustained period without consistent pastoral leadership. Along with the rest of the world, you also endured a global pandemic and its after effects. You nominated a pastoral nominating committee to search for a new pastor, first on your own, and then in tandem with Wyoiga. And then you had to wait as the whole process unfolded. Through it all, I'm sure you had questions and concerns. Would the church be able to go on? or would the doors need to close? 
who would take on this responsibility or that one in the interim period? What programs and community events can be managed with a few dedicated volunteers and which ones will have to end for this time at least? You tackled questions around worship service times and expectations for a shared pastor. You continue to ask the hard questions around outreach and what will draw in new members and families with children. Indeed, any and all of these questions could have given way to disagreement and division among you. At times, I'm sure these questions and concerns did. And yet, for some reason, you all are still here today, trying your best to share God's love and shine God's light together. And while I may not have been here for all of your challenges, I suspect I know why that is. You all know something that the Apostle Paul knew and named first, that a life in Christ is meant to be lived together in community. For Paul, the image of a human body is helpful in understanding this. In his first letter to the Corinthians, he writes, just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. That is because in baptism, all believers, regardless of race or ethnicity or economic status, are made into one body, the body of Christ. And just as the human body needs many parts from eyes and ears to hands and feet, so too does the body of Christ need many members with different abilities and gifts to share. Indeed, God intended the human body and the body of Christ to be this way. God chose for them to be interdependent, and for that reason, no member is better or more important or more useful than any other member, for together they are one body. Now, if the Corinthians didn't understand this metaphor, Paul then makes it clear. You are the body of Christ, made up of different people and different God-given gifts. There are apostles and prophets, teachers and miracle workers, healers and helpers, leaders and people who speak in tongues all of them indispensable members of the body of Christ, all of them needed for the body of Christ to work as God intended. And friends, that is true for us today. We are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Each one of us has been chosen by God to share a unique gift with the world. And our scripture reading for today is an invitation, a reminder even, that we are called to do that still. Maybe that looks like sharing your musical gift and singing with the choir. Maybe it's sharing your gift of discernment and being on session or sharing your gift of compassion and service and being a deacon. Maybe it's even as simple as sharing your gift of hospitality and greeting others here on Sunday mornings. Each one of us, regardless of age or ability or experience, is indispensable and so, so in need for us to do the work that God has called us to do together. Now, I know that there might be some resistance creeping up 
as we think about this together. Maybe you have the feeling that there isn't anything you can do to contribute, that you don't have the abundant amounts of time or some grand spiritual gift needed to actually make an impact. But I can assure you, and even sometimes myself when I need to hear it, God can always work through us, even with our limited time or our ordinariness. One of my favorite pastoral writers, you all probably know him by now, the late Henry Nowen put it so well. He compares the community of believers to a mosaic. Individually, the little stones are insignificant with different colors and shades and finishes, different shapes and sizes. Some are shiny and beautiful, others dull and plain. There is little that can be done with any of them on that individual level. And yet, when the stones are pulled together, they create a big and beautiful mosaic. So it is with the church, says Nowen. Individual stones, individual people are pulled together, creating a mosaic that reveals the face of God to the world. He writes, who would ever question the importance of any one of them? If one of them, even the least spectacular one is missing, the face is incomplete. That is true for us today too. Friends, whether you are a longtime member or a first time guest, you belong here. And even if one of us was missing, the body of Christ would be incomplete. Always remember that you belong here. Later this week, we will celebrate Thanksgiving, and then we will be off to the races. The season of Advent will begin next week, as you know. And before we know it, Christmas Eve and a new year will be here. And friends, I can tell you that I am so excited for what is to come in the life of this congregation. I'm of course excited that we will enter into a season of waiting and preparation together, and that we will celebrate the birth of our baby King together. But I'm also so excited about 2025 and the work we will do together. I'm looking forward to more opportunities for connection and faith formation and outreach to the rest of Winnicani. And I really hope you are too. On this Stewardship Sunday, it is my prayer that you might continue to share or share for the very first time your God-given gift with us. In that way, my friends, we can make the face of Christ visible to the world together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will now invite you to stand, if you are able, for our responsive hymn, Let All Things Now Living.
Please be seated. With gladness, let us present the offerings of our life and labor to the Lord. Thank you, John. If we could all please stand for our congregational doxology. Hem 367, come ye thankful people, come. Verse 1. Please join me in our unison offertory prayer. Good and gracious God, in this season of thanksgiving, we are filled with gratitude. Gratitude for you and for your continued work in the world. We ask that you might receive these gifts as thank offerings and use them to the glory of your great name. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. You may be seated. Please pray with me. Good and gracious God, as we approach Thanksgiving Day, we come before you with immense gratitude for the great things you have done for us. 
We thank you for using your creative energies to bring this beautiful and ever-changing world into being and for creating each one of us to care for and enjoy it. We thank you for sending your one and only son into this world and redeeming us while we were sinners and unable to redeem ourselves. And we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that guides us and inspires us still. We thank you also for the seemingly small things, the things we take for granted, our family and friends who love and support us, our resources that sustain us from day to day, the gifts that are meant to be shared with the world. We thank you, Lord God, for this community of faith and for this safe and sacred place where we can freely worship you. Father God, we lift up to you our brothers and sisters who couldn't be with us today. We pray for those who are sick and those who are homebound. We ask that they might feel your abiding spirit wherever they are. Lord God, we pray also for those who are facing serious health complications, those who are preparing for surgery, and those who are already on the road to recovery. We ask, Almighty God, for you to be present with these, your people. Strengthen them and uphold them by the power of your spirit. Today, Lord God, we come to you with both joy and sorrow, and we lift up to you especially the Grimer family following this traumatic event in their lives. We pray that you might strengthen the entire family for the days, weeks, and months ahead. We pray that their son is able to receive adequate care and that he will recover from this. Almighty God, we also lift up to you, Sarah, upon the diagnosis of her cancer. We pray that you might send a care team who is able to provide her with the best care possible. I pray that you might strengthen her too, Lord God. Today, we also come to you with joy, and we thank you for Nicole's father's good outcome. We pray that he might continue on this road. We also pray for Karen and for her family and for all people traveling this week and weekend. We pray for travel mercies, that you keep everyone safe until they return home. And Almighty God, we thank you for the work of this community. We thank you for this past weekend at Thrift and Gift, for the work that is accomplished in the wider community. Lord God, as we enter into another holiday season, we know that there will be many tables with empty chairs. We therefore pray for those who are grieving. You have promised to be near to the brokenhearted, and we rest confidently in that promise. We ask that you might draw near, O oh God, and comfort your people in this difficult season. Please, Lord God, be with them. Be also with those who do not have the option to be home for the holidays, especially our servicemen and service women. Keep each one of them safe until they return home to their families. Lord God, today we continue to pray for our nation, our president, our government officials, and all world leaders. We ask that you might send your spirit upon all people who are in positions of power. Inspire them to work toward justice and reconciliation. Inspire each one of us here today to do the same. Help us to go out into the world and be the body of Christ, working together to make visible the invisible. All these things we do pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who first taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I will invite you to stand once more for our closing hymn, Now Thank We All Our God. My friends, go in peace to love and serve our Lord together. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you both now and forevermore. Amen. Our worship service is over. Our service in the world begins. Amen.